Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, last chapter of our course in Structural Geology, Part 2, Tectonic Settings. Today we are talking about transform settings and strike slip faulting. From the uh, first and second year course, you might remember that strike slip faults are fairly straightforward structures, but wherever they are curving or sidestepping, they might be associated with a dip slip component of displacement, such as uh, these. Uh, uh, pull apart basins that we see here if a sinistral strike slip fault would step to the left or if a, a dextral strike slip fault would step to the left we would get a an association of strike slip faulting and contractional tectonics such as reverse or thrust faults this would form then pop-up structures structures whereas these here would be pull apart basins Transform settings in the narrow sense are those related to large-scale plate tectonic processes and most of them are developed along transform boundaries in the oceanic environment where we have the sidestepping of mid-oceanic ridge segments. Two important features are fairly well studied and they, because they are on land and these would be the San Andreas Fault in California and the Alpine Fault in the South Island of New Zealand. And we are going to talk about these two structures in a bit more detail. Here we see the two. Uh, the South Island of New Zealand is here showing the Alpine Fault, a dextral transform fault which connects subduction zones pointing here to the west and uh, one here to the east. These would be plate boundaries between the Australian plate here, the left-hand side, and the Pacific plate on the right-hand side. The situation in California is more complicated because here large-scale strike slip faulting is associated with the subduction of a mid-oceanic ridge that we see here in northern California, north of the Mendocino fracture zone, and here in the Baja California uh, in uh, Mexico. Let's start with the uh, New Zealand situation and look at it uh, in a bit more detail. We see here these contractional zones, uh, the uh, subduction zones with the Pacific plate on the right hand side. Here shown in yellow is grading into a transform fault down here. This is the Alpine fault crossing South Island. And uh, here we have again the conversion into a contractional, into a subduction zone here further to the south. When you look at this uh, coastal segment of the Alpine Fault, over here you see that uh, it is fairly sharply defined in the topography. We have a low-lying coastal line here on the western side of the Alpine Fault. On the eastern side we have high ground. Uh, this would suggest that there's also some sort of uh, dip-slip component associated with strike-slip. The San Andreas Fault has a more complex situation. Uh, the Alpine Fault is a fairly simple strike slip transform fault. In order to understand the San Andreas Fault, we have to step back in time a little bit uh, by about 35 million years. At that time, the situation was uh, very similar to what we see in South America with an Andean type setting. We had here the Farallon Plate, which is a young oceanic plate being frontally subducted underneath the North American continental plate. This resulted in the formation of a fairly high plateau and an overall Andean type situation. When you look here at the geometry of this mid-oceanic ridge, you see that it is here stepping to the east quite significantly along a transform fault. And uh, during the subduction of the Farallon plate, plate this part of the mid-oceanic ridge was subducted underneath the North American plate. This had very important implications because now the plate boundary between the North American plate and the Farallon plate was replaced by a plate boundary between the North American plate and the Pacific plate. And look here, the plate movement vector of the Pacific plate is very different from that of the Farallon plate. We see here the Pacific plate is moving more or less parallel to the North American west coast. And that would mean that uh, if you have such a movement of the Pacific plate and relatively a southern movement of the North American plate, this subduction zone, this frontal subduction, is replaced by dextral strike slip movement. With time, more and more of the, uh, the mid-oceanic ridge underwent subduction and the Farallon plate is in the process of disappearing. We still see it off the northwestern coast of uh, the North American plate, 
but uh, larger and larger proportions of this mid-oceanic ridge underwent subduction. And this means that the length of the strike slip fall, which now represent the, represents the plate boundary of the North American plate, uh, became longer and longer. A very short segment in the beginning grew in size continuously until the situation that we have today. This here is a little bit incorrectly drawn. This uh, mid-oceanic ridge should actually sit right here in the Baja California, where we have oceanic lithosphere. Important for the whole evolution of the strike slip fault is that throughout time, in the last 35 uh, million years, the movement vector of the Pacific plate was to the north-northwest. And this caused the strike slip faulting, which uh, today causes these devastating earthquakes in Southern California. If we generalize these uh, different kinds of settings that we uh, see with transform faults, uh, we have the most common type of transform faults connecting the spreading segments of mid-oceanic ridges from such a position to such a position or also the other way around. We also have seen, like in the case of New Zealand, that we might have a connection between different segments of subduction zones by transform faults. Of course, you can combine now also uh, segments of mid-oceanic ridges with segments of subduction zones that also could be done by transform fault. In the second tier class, we have talked a little bit about the initiation of uh, transform faults in the continental stage because, uh, as you know, mid-oceanic ridges uh, start their history as uh, rifts, as continental rift zones. And here we see such a situation in a cratonic environment. A rift is developing, and uh, once a, a rift is hitting a pre-existing older structure, or for other reasons uh, shows such a sidestepping like here with different segments, we will connect these rift uh, segments by a so-called transfer fault, uh, which in fact is nothing else but a transform fault. If the uh, continental breakup continues and we are getting uh, the formation of oceanic lithosphere along uh, mid-oceanic ridges, the continental lith lithosphere will be removed sideways along these transform faults with continuous uh, spreading along mid-oceanic ridges. Fracture zones develop uh, a long strike uh, in the continuation of such active transform faults, but uh, you need to take into account that this and this part belong to the same plate and uh, they move in the same direction and that means we cannot expect a lot of seismic activity or displacement along such fracture zones. Fracture zones are only active if the spreading rate of, of such a segment of a mid-oceanic ridge would be larger or smaller than the next neighboring segment. Only then we would have different movement velocities of this and this part of the same plate, which would require some displacement along the fracture zone. However, here along the transform fault, we are looking at a plate, a plate boundary of one plate to the other plate with opposite movement directions. And of course, here we would have a very intense displacement and a high seismic activity in the shallow brittle crust. Increasing the size of the oceanic basin will transport more and more material continuously along these uh, transform faults. But uh, it needs to be noted that the length of the transform fault will not increase or decrease as long as these mid-oceanic ridge segments are of the same spreading rate. It only means that all oceanic material that is transported by this and by this, um, by this segment of the mid-oceanic ridge has to pass each other along this transform fault, which accumulates a lot of displacement. If you are opening a oceanic basin of several thousand kilometers, perhaps in width, you would have several thousands of kilometers displacement along such a transform fault, which in itself might be only a few kilometers or a few tens of kilometers long. That means the length of the transform fault does not correlate with the amount of displacement that is accumulated. The amount of displacement accumulated depends on the width of the oceanic basin. Again, we need to distinguish uh, transcurrent faults in, for instance, the 
continental lithosphere, which are just normal strike slip faults. Here we might have the offset of pre-existing features such as a dike which has formed at a certain stage and later gets displaced by strike slip faulting. With increasing accumulation of strain we will have more and more displacement and these segments of a dike would move further and further apart. Also the length of the transcurrent fault would increase. This is not so in the mid-oceanic ridge. First obviously if we have a mid-oceanic ridge uh, geometry similar like these dikes here offset to the left uh, then we would have a dextro strike slip fault here but this transform fault would while it accumulates more and more strain with the production of more and more oceanic lithosphere it would not grow in length unless the mid oceanic ridge segments are spreading at different rate also yes please don't forget transform faults are plate boundaries. Plate A and plate B are separated by this transform fault. So what have we learned about uh, transform faults in the wider sense? They are plate boundaries. The active portion of such transform faults ends at very well-defined fixed points and this might be mid-oceanic ridge segments. They might be mid-oceanic ridges and trenches or they might be different segments of trenches such as in the New Zealand situation. The fault length normally remains constant if the spreading rates and subduction rates are constant and uniform but uh, in the case uh, that we change spreading rates here or subduction rates versus spreading rate in such a situation might vary then we could uh, change the length of a uh, transform fault. For instance, if the subduction rate here in such a subduction zone exceeds the production rate along a mid-oceanic ridge, we would move the mid-oceanic ridge closer and closer to the subduction zone and eventually would subduct that mid-oceanic ridge. If the mid-oceanic ridge produces more new oceanic lithosphere than is destroyed by subduction, then the oceanic basin would grow and the length of such a transform fault would increase. The situation like in uh, the Californian uh, environment is more complicated. Here large-scale large strike slip faulting along the San Andreas Fault is related to the disappearance and subduction of a mid-oceanic ridge and the closest point of the mid-oceanic ridge or related transform faults are connected by such strike slip faults which form the new plate boundary. And if uh, these two points, T1 and T2, would uh, separate further and further, then the length of the strike slip fault of the connecting transform fault would uh, also increase, as it is the case in the San Andreas fault. Last not least, the uh, displacement along such transform faults can exceed their length. Let's compare transform faults with normal transcurrent faults. Other than uh, transform faults, which have fixed points of uh, beginning and end, uh, the transcurrent faults normally die out, they fizzle out in some form of, uh, of geometry. Very often these can be splays or erase, eraser faults, which are called horsetail structures. We are going to look at them in a minute. Or they also can dissipate into a zone of plastic strain. The amount of displacement along a transcurrent fault uh, usually correlates with the length of a fault. Uh, if uh, you want to uh, accumulate more and more strain along a strike slip fault, you have to increase this strike slip fault also. Length, you have to propagate that fault. Uh, we have talked about curving segments of strike slip faults. Um, the, these strike slip faults either can be splays or they can be uh, transpressive or transtensive uh, segments if you have a releasing or a restraining bend. Let's talk about splays uh, for a little bit. Uh, you see here a strike slip fault that uh, fizzles out, that dissipates and uh, distributes its strain into a series of splays. And these splays can curve away either in this way from a dextral strike slip fault or they can curve away in that orientation. This would result in uh, this case here into a series of uh, listric normal faults, uh, as we see here in the block diagram. If the curvature uh, 
of a dextrose strike slip falls goes here to the left hand side in this direction and uh, to the bottom side here. That direction then we would produce a series of thrust falls, normally Lystric thrust falls, and we could even form something like duplex structures or imbricate fans associated with strike slip faulting. Looking at the stress field uh, orientation that we would expect in a strike slip fall, sigma 1 would be uh, roughly at 30 degrees with respect to the main strike slip fault, and if curvature occurs in this direction, then these curving splays would be more or less parallel to sigma 1. However, the, uh, these are not in the narrow sense uh, Anderson type faults. Uh, the, the kinematic along these faults here is controlled by the movement of the lateral blocks. Here, in this case, a dextra movement. A dextra movement would impose a normal faulting on such faults that we see here, assuming they are dipping to the right hand side here and to the left hand side here. For the same reason, these curvatures here would be thrust faults. In this case, the curvature would occur into an orientation perpendicular to sigma 1, and you know that would uh, require thrusting along uh, fault segments dipping as indicated here. So these plays are forming at the end of primary faults and they curve into the direction parallel or perpendicular to sigma 1, and accordingly they display contractional or extensional kinematics. And the kinematics are controlled by the overall displacement along the main strike slip fault. We see that here. I do not want to talk in more detail about the local uh, geology of the San Andreas Fault. The San Andreas Fault also has curving segments and accordingly it would have uh, pull apart basins or it would have uh, pop-up structures. You might read up in chapter 19 of uh, Van der Plum and Marshak a little bit more about the regional geology in California. Let's have a look here at flower structures again. We have just talked about pop-up structures and pull-apart basins in relationship with the restraining or releasing bends along curving or sidestepping uh, strike slips falls. Uh, just a reminder, a positive flower structure is such a strike slip fall, a curving part of a strike slip fall, where we have contractional tectonics, reverse faulting associated with strike slip faulting. That would mean each individual fault in such a flower structure has a strike slip and a reverse component. If the uh, sidestepping is in opposite direction, then we would create space and we would have a normal component associated with strike slip faulting. So all these faults here are either extensional or contractional oblique slip faults. This is also a uh, scheme that we have seen in the second year course. The uh, illustration of dextral and sinistral strike slip faulting with the respective uh, sidestepping or curvature, creating either restraining or releasing vents. You might revise that yourself. Let's come back to the New Zealand situation and to the earthquakes associated with the Alpine fault. Here we see a time interval of 10 years with the uh, recorded seismic events in New Zealand at that time. We see here the Australian plate, we see the Pacific plate, we see uh, South Island here, and we see the Alpine fault and associated structures are highlighted by the occurrence of seismic events. Here these seismic events are color coded depending on their depth, and uh, this illustration only shows earthquakes uh, deeper than 40 kilometers along this large transform fault. And this uh, tells us that this transform fault uh, seems to be uh, dipping to the, to the northwest because deep earthquakes are recorded here in the western part, in the northwestern part of the South Island and the shallower earthquakes are here more to the southeastern part. I would like to uh, look at a specific event in 2010 and another one in 2011, which are related to each other. This is the uh, Darfield event that occurred uh, in a series of earthquakes uh, between the 3rd and the 6th of September in 2010. This was an event here not too far away from Christchurch, about 50 kilometers away from Christchurch. Uh, 
And uh, here we had a, a seismic event that was quite significant. It was 7.0, 7.1 in magnitude. That is a very significant earthquake that hit on Friday, the 3rd of September. Its kinematic relationship was uh, closely associated with the Alpine fault. It was a strike-slip faulting event in the Pacific plate. That means here on the uh, eastern side of the Alpine fault, but its structure uh, was uh, parallel to the uh, Alpine fault. It was also a strike slip, a dextral strike slip fault. Uh, and also it was uh, 80 or 90 kilometers uh, away from the Alpine fault. It is kinematically associated with this structure. Here we see a illustration uh, taken from the United States Geological Survey website. Uh, it, uh, displays where how the intensity of the earthquake dissipated with distance to the hypocenter. Uh, everything that you see here in red and dark orange colors uh, indicates a quite uh, intense uh, shaking of the ground. So this is a shake map with a number of parameters that uh, quantify it with uh, not felt to weak uh, up to violent and extreme magnitude of uh, ground shaking. And, uh, and you see here that Christchurch itself, uh, one of the bigger cities on si in South Island, was at the periphery of this event. That means also we had here a very significant uh, seismic event. It was far enough outside of a densely populated area in order to create uh, significant damage. And accordingly, this was not really much of a news at the time outside of New Zealand. We see here a distribution of events in the time from between the 3rd and the 6th of September. We had here the major magnitude 7 earthquake in this position. And along this uh, strike slip fault, uh, quite a number of uh, fairly significant seismic events as for and after shocks. Most of them were strike slip faults, as these symbols here indicate. Over a longer time period, you see here for the whole rest of the September, there were a couple of dozen earthquakes uh, also related as aftershocks related to the event uh, of the uh, 4th of September. Here are a few uh, features that uh, were caused by this event. You see here dextral offset of this uh, array of trees and here also this fence here was uh, offset by dextral strike slip by a certain distance. We don't have really a very good uh, scale here. This might be something like two meters offset. Also here uh, features that uh, resemble a little bit the geometry of uh, perhaps uh, an echelon tension gashes or conjugated faults. Here a similar fracture pattern in tar uh, at an intersection of two roads. However, the damage of this uh, of this event in early September was not very significant because it happened outside of a populated, densely populated area. So now a few months later in February 2011, there was a very significant aftershock, a uh, 6.3 magnitude, uh, significantly weaker than the 7.0 or 7.1 main shock on 4th of September. But this aftershock was located very close to Christchurch Center. And that made it a disaster. That made it uh, affecting human buildings and human life. And therefore, it is uh, classified as, uh, as a disaster, and not as a natural geological event uh, of uh, purely academic interest. We see here a distribution of the main seismic events between September and February, March. And uh, you see here that since the 22nd of February, there is a shift of seismic activity from outside of Christchurch to the vicinity of, of the city. This map shows a very similar distribution. These are the seismic events in the time between September and 20th of February 2011. Uh, you see here a large cluster of earthquakes, some of them quite significant, but uh, Christchurch is located, located somewhere here. You see essentially all that happened away from the city. Now see here on the next map, you see the cumulated effects. Here from the 22nd of, uh, of February, we have an extension of the seismic cluster towards the location of Christchurch, and that caused significant damage. Again, let's go back here 
this is before the Christchurch event, and this is the Darfield event plus the Christchurch event from end of uh, February in, uh, in 2011. Of course, it carried on uh, with seismic activity for a few more days. Uh, this, uh, this shows now the data up to 2nd of March uh, when it calmed down again. Here we see a map of Christchurch and the location of the main aftershock, this 6.3 magnitude event. We're sitting here about uh, five kilometers southeast of Christchurch center, and it was a shallow earthquake uh, at a depth of uh, only about uh, five kilometers. As you know, this is very, this is still well in the brittle part of the crust, where you anyway would expect most of the seismic activity. Here the uh, focal mechanism solutions again, the main event shown in red, this was a 6.3 magnitude. And you can see here that this event was not a strike-slip event. Strike-slip symbols, these uh, symbols here indicate the kinematics. This here would be a strike-slip. Also this here would be pretty much pure strike-slip. You see all four segments intersecting in the center of the symbol. You can read that in a very similar way, like uh, you would read a, uh, a stereo net. And uh, we have uh, discussed this briefly in the second year class, uh, I believe. Uh, otherwise, just look it up in the internet. Uh, just look up uh, focal mechanism solutions, and then you'll find explanations how to interpret these uh, symbols. However, strike slip falls are looking like that. Oblique slip falls would look like this or like this, or perhaps like this. And uh, so we would ask the question, why do we have in an overall strike-slip setting, in a, an environment where kinematics and earthquakes should be related to transform faulting, why would we have here such a combination between strike-slip and reverse faulting? The answer is fairly easy. Also, transform faults might have curving bends. And, uh, what might have happened here in the Christchurch region during this event on 22nd of February might be the activation of a restraining bend of a strike-slip fault. Since this event happened fairly close to uh, Christchurch, and here the uh, city is outlined and shaded in gray, uh, we uh, will find quite a bit of damage even to uh, buildings that uh, have been standing for probably a couple of hundred years. Here you see uh, the damage kind of uh, kind of damage that occurred. There were also, uh, unfortunately, a few lives taken by this event. And uh, you see here, uh, certainly people had quite a bit of problem to remove a rubble of that size out of their backyard. This event was in the media for quite a while because Christchurch is uh, in a in an area where obviously the media are present and. Uh, there was talk about the Christchurch event for quite a few months, until a few weeks later, in fact, the mega earthquake occurred in Japan, and then the media would focus on this uh, 9.1 or 9.0 magnitude earthquake in J Japan, or the tsunami, and the disaster in the nuclear power plants. Of course, nobody was interested anymore in a 6.3 event in Christchurch. This is the end of this chapter, and this is the end of the course. Thank you very much for this third year course in structural geology.